Good evening, everybody. This is Ben Powers coming at you from the Commander's Voice. My guest tonight is Mr. Hans Myers, and he is the author of the book, The Lion of Round Top. And it's a fantastic book about the brigade commander uh, who first saw Little Round Top as a, a key position. Hans will, will get us all into the discussion as we go forward, but an officer named Strong Vincent. Uh, He's a footnote to history. Hans's uh, thesis is that he should be the, the, you know, the main character, as it were, of the Round Top Saga. Uh, he put a lot of research and a lot of time into making a very convincing argument, and we're really excited to talk about it tonight. So, Hans, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. All right. So uh, we'll jump right into it, Hans. I've indicated in our correspondence leading up to this interview that, you know, I'm unabashedly a Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain guy, and you are very fair to the legacy of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. But you kind of make the point that, you know, for a at the time, a relatively untried regimental commander, he got way more than his fair share of credit for what goes on day two of the Battle of Gettysburg in the defense of Little Round Top, and that his uh, post-war reputation eclipses that of Vincent. Uh, uh, so what got you started on making this argument and deciding that you're going to be a uh, an apologist, if you will, for Vincent? Well, what really got me started was in May of 2013, about a month, month and a half before the sesquicentennial of the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, I was in Gettysburg, and it wasn't my first trip there. It was my fifth or sixth at that point. And I was on Little Round Top, and I found there's a boulder beside the Monument of the 12th and the 44th New York, the castle on top of Little Round Top. Uh, and carved into the flat surface on the top of this boulder is just the inscription, Colonel Strong Vincent fell here. July 2nd, 1863, commanding 3rd Brigade, 1st Division, 5th Corps. And I'm from Erie, Pennsylvania. I'm from Strong Vincent's hometown. Uh, and I'd always sort of vaguely been aware of Vincent. Uh, he is the namesake of what was then a local high school. It's now a middle school here in Erie due to, recon due to consolidation of the district. And I'd never really given it much thought, you know, it was just always one of those things, the sort of general knowledge of just, oh, Strong Vincent, he was a Civil War officer that exists nowhere else, because this is his hometown. And I was looking at this boulder, and I'm familiar with the 1993 Ronald F. Maxwell film Gettysburg, where Vincent is portrayed very fleetingly by English actor Max Caulfield. And I thought to myself, it's weird. We focus so much on Chamberlain as if he was the only one who was there. I mean, Ken Burns' documentary series, The Civil War, would lead you to believe the 20th Maine stood alone on Little Round Top. And so I thought, what about these other men who were there? Not Governor Warren, he's already an interesting figure in his own right. But I mean, those who have sort of been lost to history, you know, there's Charles Hazlitt, there's Stephen Weed, there's Strong Vincent, there's Patrick O'Rourke. And as I started getting into it, I started to really be drawn to the story of Vincent because here he was this elite son of a wealthy family, Harvard education, brilliant career prospects in the army. And he seems to almost be working against himself in a lot of ways. He turns down promotion offers to stay in the field he tries to get back to the army just as soon as he can after a very bad bout of the Chickahominy fever in 1862 following the Peninsula Campaign. And he basically makes his young bride a war widow in 1861. He's only home on leave once the entire duration of the war. And I just got fascinated by him. And the more I started digging into it, the more I realized it was Vincent who saved Little Round Top for the Union Army. It was Vincent who secured the left flank of the Army of the Potomac. And Chamberlain, for one reason or another, has received all of the credit for that. 
Oh, there we go. That, that kind of runs down the whole motivation for writing the book. So for folks who may not be familiar, as you indicated in the, the film Gettysburg, he's very fleeting. He's very fleeting as a character in Shower's original novel. He was a very young man when he mm -hmm. initially you know, joins the Union Army in 1861. He's still a young man in 1863. He was only in his a late young man still when he dies. Yeah. And so what 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 do you could you give everyone listening a rundown of of how much he packed into that brief military career between April 1861 and July of 1863? Well, he was one of the first men to enlist in Erie County. He was one of the members of what was called the Wayne Guards. They were the militia company of the city of Erie in the late 1850s. He joined shortly after returning from Harvard in 1859. And from the time Fort Sumter was fired upon and President Lincoln's proclamation for 75,000 troops goes out, he's basically just a nonstop force of nature within the army. Uh, within a year, he's a major. Within another year, he's a colonel commanding the regiment and filling in as acting brigade commander. So in two years, he's gone from first lieutenant, which he first enlisted as, to Fulberg colonel commanding a brigade and having George Meade say, I wish he was a brigadier general, I'd give him command of a division. And then just another year later, he's dead as a brigadier general. Yes, sir. So a, a meteoric rise by any stretch of the imagination. And when he was a regimental commander, correct me if I'm wrong, he's commanding the 83rd Pennsylvania, correct? That's correct. He was the regimental commander of the 83rd Pennsylvania. He succeeded Colonel John W. McLean, who's also the namesake of a different local high school, General McLean High School, even though he was never made a general. Uh, and he was succeeded by Captain Orpheus Woodward, who would command the 83rd until he would be killed. I believe it was in the siege of Petersburg. Oh, my goodness. That's a, a hazardous role being a regimental commander in the infantry during the American Civil War. Well, well in, the, in the 83rd in particular, I forget where the citation is, but someone once crunched the numbers to try and figure out the federal regiments that sustained the most fatalities throughout the Civil War. And I believe the 82nd, 83rd Pennsylvania was number two on the list. Oh, my goodness. That That's a very, very uh, elite group of men then dying in combat at the head of their regiment. That's for certain. Yes. The uh, So the following question I have is he rises to brigade command. So take us to the second day uh, at Gettysburg when Little Round Top is still uncovered and okay. Vincent first gets the word that his services may be required there on the field. Well, it all begins with Dan Sickles, obviously, because, I mean, Sickles' third corps was initially slated to cover Little Round Top, the extreme left of the Union line in the famous fish hook. And so when Sickles, who's, I want to say a bit of a paranoid nutbag, that feels unnecessarily insulting to Sickles, I don't hate him, unlike a good many people who studied the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, when Sickles advances his third corps because he expects a flanking attack to come out of the woods, which, in fact, it will do, he leaves the round tops bare and completely undefended. The closest federal troops are in Devil's Den, which is, as someone who's been to Gettysburg knows, quite a bit further from the round tops than it looks when you're looking at pictures or looking at a map. And so Governor Warren, chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac, is sent to go inspect the hills, see if he can spot anything, any weaknesses in the Union's left flank. And he finds them undefended he finds little round top short of trees with its relatively flat top and he starts thinking to himself this is a great artillery standpoint if the confederates get a battery up here we're going to have to abandon the entire line and so he sends out his first call for reinforcements and that primarily is going to need and to sickles as the closest corps commander sickles can't spare a man because by this point longstreet's two divisions under mcclaws and hood are engaging his front. He's engaged along the entire length of his new line at the Emmitsburg Road. And as, as Warren's aide is leaving Sickles' headquarters, he runs into somehow the 5th Corps commander, George Sykes, and repeats his request for reinforcements. Sykes says, I can give you a brigade. He sends one of his own aides looking for James Barnes, who was the commander of the 1st Division, 5th Corps. And Barnes is 
nowhere to be found. Sykes' aide is riding around looking for him, and he comes across Vincent, whose men are waiting to advance. They're in column of fours at the near the farms at the base of Little Round Top. And Vincent rides up to meet this aide, and he just says, what are your orders? The aide says, I'm looking for General Barnes. Vincent insists, what are your orders? Give me your orders. The aide finally just says, General Sykes told me to direct General Barnes to take a brigade to hold that hill yonder. And he points up at Little Round Top. And Vincent doesn't wait for an order. He doesn't wait for permission from his division commander. He just says, I will take the responsibility. And he moves his brigade there. And if the Confederates have never shown up, that's a court martial for dereliction of duty exertion. As it was, he had just barely got his men up there. They're all online. They've just thrown out their skirmishers, and not even five minutes later, the skirmishers are being driven back in by the first Confederate regiments. And I think that that's an amazing snapshot in time. Uh, the, the author, Herman Woke, he was writing about the Navy, but he has a great line in the book, The Cane Mutiny, that the purpose of command is to make decisions and take responsibility. And that's precisely what Strong Vincent does there. And for, if for no other reason, he is very high, and especially after reading your book in my pantheon of personal heroes, is that there, there's an officer who knew it had to be done and he was not afraid yeah. to, to take that responsibility regardless of the potential consequences. So that, that's yes. just amazing. And unfortunately, other than, you know, I place you here, hold to the last man, as Shara makes it sound like he's, he issues that order to Chamberlain, he kind of disappears from history at this point. And as you said, there's this popular notion uh, because of the fiction in, in the in film that at this point, it's all about uh, Chamberlain in the 20th Maine. And I find that interesting because you, you referred earlier to uh, Hazlitt and, and Weed and these different uh, officers who brought their batteries or troops up to the hill. There's a scene where Chamberlain sends uh, one of his NCOs to get help. And when he reports back, he's reporting, you know, different, there's a furious engagement at the top of the hill, Weed's dead, Hazlitt's dead. He's listing pretty much every officer in a command positions down on the, up, on the top of the hill. Yet the questions never further developed. Well, why is the 20th Maine, the, 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 the heroes of the day, if equally furious fighting is taking place all along the, 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 uh, the crest of the, of the hill, as it were? And no one ever gets into that. Well, I think, I think for the most part, I don't, I'm not a Chamberlain hater. I don't want to put any illusions about that in anyone's mind. I, I deeply appreciate Chamberlain as a man, as an officer, as a politician after the war. I think a lot of it has to do with, for lack of a better phrase, how cinematic the 20th Maine was at Little Round Top on July 2nd, 1863, because they made their famous bayonet charge. Now, you can argue from now until the end of time whether the charge was actually ordered, whether Holman Melcher led the charge, whether the 20th Maine hesitated, but because they did make that counteroffensive, because they did make the bayonet rush at the 15th Alabama, they sort of became the fixtures of the visualization of the fight on the left at Gettysburg. And I think that really has a lot to do with why the narrative is so focused on them. Because it's this great scene of courage in the face of adversity. It's this great thrilling moment that you know you want to buy the Mort Kunstler painting of and stick it above your mantelpiece or <laughs> if you can't afford the $600 painting you know the poster at the visitor center at Gettysburg that's not a knock on Chamberlain of the 20th Maine at all because it is an inspired moment of heroism in a battle that must have been nightmarish to experience in the thick trees on that slope of Little Round Top where you've got smoke hanging in the air, the sun's starting to get low, so it's getting dark out, you're out of ammunition. You can just hear the noises of combat all around you. You don't know if you're surrounded and cut off from retreat. It takes a lot in a moment like that to do what they did. Oh, certainly. And you know, full disclosure, I've got my Chamberlain portrait looking down on me right now off camera. So he's he's very high in my pantheon as well. But um, obviously, there's four regiments in the brigade. Uh, I shouldn't say obviously, but for the listeners, you have the 20th Maine, the 83rd Pennsylvania, and also it was the um, 44th New York and the 16th Michigan, correct? Yes, 
So, e so in addition to all the other units, weeds unit, or O'Rourke's unit, Hazlitt's battery, everybody's you know doing their job as part of the defense. You've got three other regiments in this brigade that are fully involved in, in, in defending the hill. And Strong Vincent's attention is focused elsewhere. Uh, he never comes back into the Chamberlain narrative. narrative uh, I'm not saying he, Chamberlain's abandoned, but he's left to command his regiment. So what is yes. Vincent doing during the rest of the fight? During the rest of the fight, Vincent is... I think really the best way to kind of describe it is he's pacing like a caged tiger, to borrow, to borrow the animal metaphor. Uh, we know for a fact he mostly was staying behind the 83rd Pennsylvania's right flank because that was pretty much the center of his line. Uh, he was standing on a boulder behind them. And if you go to Gettysburg, it's a bit difficult to find. There's a rather messy trail that leads back into the woods just south of the castle monument to the 44th and 12th New York, where you can find the boulder he was standing on. There's a marble slab on top of the boulder. It was actually the first monument placed on the battlefield outside of the cemetery. Uh, to Vincent, just bearing his name, the date of his birth, the date of his death, and the Third Brigade, First Division, Fifth Corps, with the Maltese Cross of the Fifth Corps on it. Um, but we do know that for the bulk of the fighting, he was standing on top of that boulder, watching it unfold beneath him. And so where was his attention mostly focused on the 83rd because of his kinship with the regiment, or were they particularly hard hit? What, what aspect of the fighting in your research did it seem consumed the bulk of his attention? Uh, the bulk of his attention was primarily focused on trying to get reinforcements. It wasn't necessarily focused on what was immediately right in front of him. He had his aides, his little headquarters staff, running back and forth along the line. He sent several of them running to try and get reinforcements. He was keeping abreast of the situation at all points of his line. And that's actually what winds up getting him killed. Uh, the right flank of his line, the 16th Michigan, is starting to break under the concentrated fire of a couple different Texas regiments, uh, the 4th and 5th Texas, I believe. And if you look at where the 16th Michigan was positioned at Gettysburg, it's this, it's this big bulging outcropping of rocks, pretty much just directly down the slope from the castle monument that's completely bare. There's no trees. There's very little vegetation, just weeds and tall grasses that have grown up. And they were the smallest of Vincent's regiments at Gettysburg. They have about 150 men they're able to put online by the time they've sent out their skirmishers, most of whom don't return when the fighting starts. They get driven down the line. And so you've got 150 men in a bare exposed position getting fire from two or three different angles. Of course, they're going to break and run to the rear. And that's even setting aside any allegations of cowardice against their commander, Norval Welch, which several veterans of the brigade would make for the rest of their lives. And so Vincent gets reports the 16th is starting to break, and he hops off his boulder and he runs back up the slope to get to the right of his line. And these men are just streaming back towards him. He's got a riding crop he's carrying as a token of his pregnant wife back in Erie. And the descriptions of him are quite colorful at this moment. He's beating soldiers with the riding crop. He's yelling and cursing and bellowing at them to get back in line. And he finally just hops up on this big flat top boulder and he's yelling, don't give an inch, man, don't give an inch. And he drops from a shot that passes through his left groin and hip, the shot that would eventually kill him. And realistically, that was the moment where I think the defense of Little Round Top was in the balance the most. Because if it hadn't been the, for, for the fortuitous timing of the, arriving of Patrick, the arrival of Patrick O'Rourke in the 140th New York at that point, Vincent's right is collapsed. His center is starting to be threatened to give way as these Texans are spilling towards the gap in the line. And O'Rourke sees this gap doesn't even take his men out of column of four. He just hops off his horse, draws his sword, and yells down this way, boys, leads the charge himself. And that's really, I think, the moment where it was in balance. Vincent's dedicated defense and the sudden arrival of relief at that moment. Yes, sir, where I think, go ahead. 
No, okay. I was just and at this point, as you indicated, if I'm not mistaken, the 140th, they're the first infantry reinforcements to arrive after Vincent's brigade, correct? It's only been his four regiments up to this point. Correct. Okay. O'Rourke, O'Rourke's regiment, the 140th New York, predominantly Irish American raised around Rochester, New York, uh, is the first real outside relief to come. They're the first regiment of, of Weed's brigade, Stephen Weed's brigade, to arrive on the hill. And they only arrive when they did because they were personally seized by Governor Warren. He had no idea Vincent's brigade had shown up to defend the hill because Vincent's defensive position was out of sight of Warren's famous stand on the boulders with his binocular statue that marks his place for most of the fighting. They're lower down the hill. They're closer to the little hollow between the two round tops. So Warren went looking for reinforcements. He found Weed's brigade by accident, his old brigade. As a matter of fact, he commanded it before he became chief engineer. And he finds Patty O'Rourke on the 140th New York. He says, Patty, give me a regiment. He says, General Weed's gone on and expects us ahead. Patty, give me your, re your regiment. I will take the responsibility. So O'Rourke takes his men. He goes up the hill and just in time. And Rick also falls in this engagement, does he not? Yes, yeah, so O'Rourke pretty much just leads the charge forward down this way, boys, draws abreast of what's left of the 16th Michigan and the 44th New York's right flank, and is pretty much instantaneously shot through the throat. Oh, my goodness. So, again, just another example of the, the, the hazard in leading an infantry regiment in combat during the American Civil War. It's just the guys are dropping left, right, and center here. Oh, the, yeah. So, at what point? Do uh, does the brigade realize that Vincent is down? I believe Rice was next senior in command. How how, do, how does the yes. command take place? Vincent falls wounded, uh, from the best I can tell. And for your viewers or listeners, it's really sometimes very hard for historians to figure out when something happened, especially before the standardization of time around the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, England. Because prior to that, you'd have your watch set for 3.05, and he'd have his watch set for 3.07, and he'd have his watch set for 3. No one was basically standing around going, synchronize your pocket watches. So there's all sorts of conflicting timelines. And that's really something historians have to deal with a lot in a situation like the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, but from the best I can reconstruct from looking at as many sources as I can that detail Vincent's wounding, he goes down shortly before the final charge against the 20th Maine. It's shortly before Chamberlain will have the regiment make their famous bayonet charge. And James Rice comes to command at that time. The Confederates on the right are falling back because now they're outnumbered thanks to the arrival of O'Rourke's regiment and the further arrival of more of Weed's brigade on the right. So really the only threat left of the line is the 15th Alabama on the left with Chamberlain. And so Rice is going along the line. He's passing the word, Vincent's been wounded. I've taken command. And he's immediately being told the 20th thing is out of ammunition. If they come again, we will not be able to hold them back the same way. So it was pretty much instantaneously before the famous moment. Understood. Understood. So uh, obviously, Vincent was mortally wounded because he dies a few days later. Uh, yes. Was he, by any of the accounts that you have, was he cognizant of what was still happening? Did, did he know that they successfully held the position? He knew they successfully held the position. He was first taken to the Weikert farm on the eastern slopes of Little Round Top that was serving as a federal field hospital. He was actually just a short distance from uh, Stephen Weed, who would die during the night there after managing to befriend 15-year-old Matilda Pierce, a girl from Gettysburg, who would later write a book about her experience at the hospital during the battle. Uh, Vincent was just a short distance away from we there in the basement of the home. And we do know that on the night of July 2nd, Vincent's headquarters brigade Googler Oliver Norton, who is one of the major sources for information on his life, went to see him at the field hospital and told him the boys are still there, Colonel, the boys are still in the rocks. And we know Vincent smiled at him tiredly when he was told that. 
he was mostly cognizant aware for the next two days, July 3rd and July 4th. July 3rd, he was evacuated to a different field hospital further in the rear due to the risk of Confederate artillery overshooting in the lead up to Pickett's charge. He was considered a priority medical case because of his rank and because of his connections with senior army officials, including Chief of Staff Dan Butterfield. And so he's at this new field hospital, the third and fourth, and he's still aware, he's cognizant, he's talking to people, he's joking, I presume I've done my last fighting, things like that. July 5th and 6th, he's just sort of in a fugue state, for lack of a better word. He's mostly unconscious, he'll come to every so often, but he's groggy, he's out of it, he's disoriented. And then on July 7th, he dies in the early afternoon. Yes, sir. And that, and that's sort of the, the, the legacy begins or the legends. You mentioned uh, Norton, a uh, big fan of uh, the attack and defense yes. of the round top, his book. Yes. I, that seemed, struck me as a, a maybe, a, and I am in no way a Gettysburg or Civil War historian. I'm a semi well-informed fanboy, uh, but I find a lot of people don't even know about Norton's book and, and those who know about it, it doesn't get read very often. And it's, yes. but I think it's one of the best sources to get a variety of uh, opinions and a variety of feedback of what different people saw on different parts of the field to allow one to come to their own conclusions. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I mean, that's what Norton wanted. He wanted his book to not really be the definitive be all end all history of the fight from ground top because he wasn't a professional historian, but we know when he was putting the book together, what he wanted to do was amass all the official reports, amass as many eyewitness letters and testimonies he could, and put it all in one book so that future generations would be able to have everything in one place. And it was his fervent belief that doing so would be this great testament and vindication of Vincent, his commanding officer, he was incredibly fond of Vincent. And well, he was where, orderly, correct? Yeah. Pardon? He was his orderly, correct? They were very close he in was, together. He was not his orderly per se. He was the headquarters color bearer and bugler. Understood. But he, yeah. Uh, Vincent's orderly was an Irish immigrant man named John Hickey, who was called my fake called his faithful John by Vincent's wife. Uh, but Norton had an immense amount of respect and fondness for Vincent to the point where he spent the last 30 years of his life basically trying to single-handedly push back against the ever-growing notion of Chamberlain's supremacy in the fight for Little Round Top. So was, was the attack and defense of Little Round Top, the book that Norton eventually publishes, was it well received at the time it was published? It was more or less. I mean, it didn't generate waves. It wasn't a bestseller, uh, mostly because by the time Norton's publishing this book, he's unfortunately getting up there a little bit in years. Uh, he's blind. He's almost personally dependent on a secretary to arrange everything and type everything out for him. And so from the earliest days, this has led to some historians, some readers just saying you can't fully trust the authenticity of what is contained within, mostly with regards to Norton's own comments and memories contained around the various documents. I'm of the opinion that historians owe it to their subjects to look at everything. The famous case uh, that I'm sure you were planning to touch on a little later in this interview that I bring up in the book is Ellis Spear. Yes, sir. Are we, and uh, Ellis let's Spear, just go there now. Yes. Uh, Ellis Spear was the acting major of the 20th Maine at Gettysburg. He was basically Chamberlain's second in command at Gettysburg. And by the time Chamberlain dies in 1914, 1915, I forget the exact date, Ellis Spear can't stand him. He's begun a correspondence with Norton where he's saying, Chamberlain has always been notoriously of inability to tell the truth, a man, a facile pen in mind. And there's just so much vituperative between them. And a lot of that comes down to Chamberlain to publish two articles, My Story of Fredericksburg 
and his and through blood and fire at Gettysburg for the 50th anniversary of the two battles. While they were published in Cosmopolitan and Hearst magazines, both of which are edited by William Randolph Hearst, who's been known to bend the truth and selectively re-edit a few things he publishes. And we don't have the manuscript for these articles, so we can't say for sure how much was changed or what was changed. Uh, I don't think a man like Chamberlain is going to be inserting a ghost story about George Washington being seen riding with the Army of the Potomac on the way to Gettysburg myself. Uh, but those articles were really sort of the chest-thumping, martial joy of war, the glory of battle sort of thing that Hearst was well known for, let's just say. And that didn't play well with certain veterans, Spear among them. He thought Chamberlain had just sold himself out completely, had given himself over to nothing more than vain, glorious pomposity and ego. And so these words that may not, that probably were not Chamberlain's to begin with, destroyed a friendship that had lasted for, by that point, over 50 years and drove Spear firmly into the anti-Chamberlain camp. But a lot of people choose not to really look at Spear's own memoirs, his own writings, because by the time he was setting around to write them in the 19-teens, by the time he was in full fury against Chamberlain, according to some members of his family, he was beginning to suffer from senility from dementia. And so a lot of historians would just go, you can't trust anything that was Spear says. The man was going mad by this time. But if you look at the volume of the Civil War Recollections of Ellis Spear published by the University of Maine, uh, which is his diary, his day book, and the two attempts he had to write his memoirs, they more or less agree on the broad points. I mean, maybe he was getting a little confused about what was happening when maybe he was dealing with a little bit of dementia or senility. But the broad strokes were pretty much the same. And I mean, if you go back and you read the diary in the day book, that's still got so much incredibly useful information that writing the whole thing off wholesale because Ellis Spear may or may not have been getting old by the end of his life, getting a little slow, it just doesn't make sense to me as a historian. Even if Spear was getting a little senile, was getting dementia in some form or another, the charges he raises in regards to Chamberlain's conduct post-war do deserve to be examined. So in, not to put words in your mouth, but would you say in the, in the battle for the popular narrative, is, would you say that because Chamberlain's story, especially through Blood and Fire at Gettysburg, published in conjunction with the 50th anniversary, it is sort of that martial splendor, you know, yep. chest thumping kind of thing. It seizes more public imagination and it's tied to a very specific event, the celebration of the 50th. So he kind of gets his version in the public square at a time where there's a lot of public attention on what he's writing. And it's just Norton and, and Spear are just trying to play catch up at that point. Like they don't really have a chance to properly have a counter narrative i think i think it's something similar to that i mean we know chamberlain was incredibly dissatisfied with through blood and fire at gettysburg as it appeared in his published form uh we have letters from chamberlain to people who were requesting copies of the article from him basically saying the hearst editors have so mutilated my gettysburg with connective tissue i have not bothered to get copies so clearly he was dissatisfied with the final result of the article but again, lacking the manuscripts, we can never be sure what it was he originally wrote, how much it was changed. But by that point, Chamberlain's a multi-term governor of Maine. He's the winner of the Medal of Honor. He's this revered figure in the Grand Army of the Republic. He's had some bad press in the last few years due to a feud with the 15th Alabama's Colonel Oates about the placement of their monument at Gettysburg, but that doesn't really overshadow much of his reputation. He's still seen as this great hero of the war, whereas Ellis Spear and Oliver Norton are comparatively nobodies. They're just the equivalent of the Simpsons newspaper headline, Old Man Yells at Cloud <laughs> at that point. So the, the Medal of Honor itself, in no way arguing it is not a deserved decoration. Oh, not at all. 
not at all. I, I do not even begin to come close to arguing that Chamberlain does not deserve a medal. It, no, sir. I did not mean to intimate it. Um, no, but, no, of course not. But would, um, do you think the decoration itself might have caused some dissatisfaction just because Chamberlain is the only regimental commander so decorated for the action? I think, I think it did. I think that's one of the things that just ate away at, at men like Oliver Norton. Because Norton was a very prickly man. He wasn't hot-headed per se, but he was a man who held opinions and when asked about them would tell his opinions quite loudly. Uh, reading his letters from the war, it's just quite an exercise in the frustrations of camp life and at the changing commanders of the Army of the Potomac and at this and that and the other thing. And he's never shy about sharing his thoughts with the people around him, his sisters, his brother, his mother, his father, his cousins, he's writing to. And that definitely did not change as he got older. And I, there's no real documentary evidence to say that he was especially twerked off by Chamberlain getting the Medal of Honor because he does seem to have, for the most part, liked Chamberlain. Uh, in the first decade of the 20th century, he published Strong Vincent and his Brigade at Gettysburg, a much smaller work that was originally just a paper he read to the Military Order of the Royal Legion. And in that, he's got this huge appendix that's honestly almost half the length of the pamphlet that's just letters he's gotten from various high-ranking former army officers, North and South, basically just singing Vincent's praises as a commander. And one of those that he gives pride of place to was from Chamberlain, saying he'd never known a nabler commander in his grade than Vincent. I don't think he personally had anything against Chamberlain. I think he was more just torqued off that Chamberlain was getting the Medal of Honor and the governorships and getting hailed in the press as the savior of Round Top when in his eyes, it was, as Ellis Spear said in a letter between them, almost like robbing the dead. Yes, sir. Now, you do make an interesting, what I will, I'll call a character study, even if that's not precisely what you were, uh, you were going for, but uh, when you contrast Vincent to Chamberlain, and Chamberlain, in my opinion, comes off a little worse for the exchange. It's not a, uh, you're eminently fair to the man, but you kind of point out that if you look at Vincent's own words, Vincent's service, he always put himself where he felt he could be of the greatest service. And if promotion came or it didn't, that's not what he was seeking. He was seeking to have the biggest impact. Whereas you sometimes pointed out that perhaps Chamberlain was a little bit more anxious to get his brigadier star and he made no bones about it. Now, granted, he gets it after being wounded severely at Petersburg. Yes. Uh, again, well-deserved, but perhaps he was looked a little bit more towards the career prospects of Chamberlain than Vincent looked towards the career prospects of Strong Vincent. Am I getting the right read there? I, I, I think you're pretty much right. Uh, that's one of the great problems with history. I mean, we're never going to know exactly what the people we write about are thinking at one point in time or another. But I mean, if you just compare the two of them, at really major promotion opportunities in their service in the war. Uh, Vincent, in the spring of 1863, he's just been president of a court-martial board for most of their stay in winter quarters. He's just successfully defended Casper Trepp of the first United States sharpshooters against his court-martial charges. And he's offered the position of judge advocate of the Army of the Potomac. I mean, the man's a lawyer, that would be a huge boon to his post-war career there'd be only nine or 10 other lawyers in the country who could boast the same credentials. And he turns it down. He says, I enlisted to fight. And he says that while he's laughing to the people who are lambasting him for making this choice. And compare that with Chamberlain. And I say again, I like Chamberlain, but Chamberlain, it's pretty well documented, had a bit of an ego on him. In 1864, when he's temporarily in command of the brigade, following the death of James Rice in the Overland campaign, he's furious about it. I mean, there's the quote, the injustice of commanding a brigade without the, without the attending perks of the general star or whatever it is. And he's organizing this whole huge secret writing campaign of a war department to agitate for his promotion. 
there's nothing wrong with, you know, having ambition. There's nothing wrong with wanting to get ahead in life. I don't say that to criticize or censure Chamberlain in any way. But I think it's an interesting dichotomy between the pair of them. Uh, and, and, and very well well written in the book as well. It's one of my favorite sections to, to kind of read that. And it I took that as a uh, a very fair assessment and it good for people like me who tend to uh, focus on the positive qualities of my heroes and not uh, take a more warts and all view of them. So I think it was, it was definitely fantastic. Now, when you went uh, and started digging into uh, your primary source research and your secondary source research, at, at sort of as we, we've indicated, there's certainly no shortage of Chamberlain associated material. Other than Norton, what did you dig into? The, I'm assuming the OR, but uh, the official records of the War Rebellion to get um, the information you needed on uh, Strong Vincent? Well, you know, there, there's the old feeling among historians, no matter how much you find, you're always going to wish you had more. And I think that's especially true for someone like Strong Vincent, because I tried for eight, nine years. I could not find his personal papers. I could not find the more detailed records of his service that would have been given to his family after his passing. And the best I can come up with after checking archives in four different states and several different higher educational institutions, local libraries, historical studies, the best I can come up with is just like so many of the letters between Abraham and Mary Lincoln, they were destroyed after his death. And so that's a hindrance, that's a handicap going right into it. I don't have a lot of his own words, a lot of his own thoughts to someone he considered the love of his life. I don't know whether he was behind closed doors, bad-mouthing Abraham Lincoln in letters to his wife. I don't know if he was burning George McClellan in effigy around the campfire because those documents just don't seem to exist anymore so far as we know. So I really had to almost sort of work backwards. I started with a lot of the secondary work. I started with Coddington's, the Gettysburg campaign. I started with Fong's, Gettysburg, the second day. And I started looking through their bibliographies and seeing where they got their information on Vincent. Then I looked through those bibliographies and saw where they got their information on Vincent. And I built it backwards, almost sort of step by step by step from the big overall top-down view and to, to one that I hope is a lot more focused, but also does right by the man where I could. Yes, sir. I, I would argue you, you succeed admirably. And I, I'm fascinated by your process, as you said, working backwards for some of the major works. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have the experience, and, and maybe you didn't, where, you know, let's say you start with, with Fonz and you see, okay, you read the bibliography. Okay, that's an interesting source. And you work it back to Codding and a little further back. And you kind of reach a point where there's no primary source. Somebody just kind of maybe made something up and people are quoting, <laughs> quoting that all throughout their literature, but it never traces back to anything where you can be like, okay, I can, I can see this as a, whether it's a letter, whether it's the OR, whether it's even a contemporary magazine article. I, 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 sort, I sort of actually get into this in the appendix of the book where I'm talking about the origins of what I call the Chamberlain myth, the version of Chamberlain that's become almost, you know, the unassailable marble man <laughs> on the mountaintop to borrow the metaphor of Robert E. Lee in, su in some circles. Uh, but I sort of get into this there. There's a man called Peter Garish. He was a private company agent of the 20th Maine. And in 1882, he published a book called Army Life, which was his memoirs of the war. By this point, he's a minister in, I think it's Lincoln County, Maine. And it's a very, you know, direct, very personal style. I did this, I saw this, I felt this, I heard this, I said that. And then suddenly it sort of shifts. Let me get the chapter on Gettysburg. It's a lot of we all of a sudden. And if you're not what if you're not aware it's gonna happen, it's a little jarring when you're going through and you're reading it. And I started wondering to myself, what gives with this? Because this doesn't seem normal. So I went to Thomas Desjardins, who's one of the leading historians of the 20th Maine, his book, He's Honored Dead on the Memory of Gettysburg. And I start looking into it and Desjardins found out Theodore Garish wasn't with the regiment at Gettysburg. He was in a military hospital in Philadelphia. 
And as you keep reading his kind of Gettysburg, it just, it gets weirder because suddenly he's back to the eye. He's saying things like he watched his tent mates stumble around from a mortal wound. He hears the dying words of Captain Lands. And all of a sudden, I'm just going, this doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> and I mean, if you look at bibliographies on the Civil War or on Gettysburg in general, nine times out of ten, you're going to find Theodore Garish army life army life right there and as john pullen author of the 20th maine the regimental history said in the 1980s 1990s books are built on other books and no book on the civil war has been built on more than theodore garish's army reminiscences and i don't think garish deliberately set out to you know falsify the historical record I think he was trying to cobble together what he could from what he heard from other people and perhaps got a little overzealous. I don't know if that's just me being too optimistic or too kind-hearted to the man, you know, 140 years later. But it's a suspect narrative at its best because it's all second-hand or third-hand. Masquerading is first-hand. And when it was published in 1882, we actually have at least two different sources. We have Captain Nichols, who was also in Lincoln County, who published an open letter to Garish, basically calling his account of Gettysburg complete fiction. And we have a fragment of a letter from Chamberlain to Garish that's in the main state archives in Augusta that basically is just Chamberlain's summation of the moment when the order for the bayonet charge was issued. And there's a certain, I don't want to necessarily say peevishness to the tone of the letter, but it definitely reads as if Chamberlain is attempting to set the record straight with Garish, just know you're wrong about this and here's what happened. But Garish's narrative of the fighting on the round top has just become so enmeshed with how it's presented, how it's portrayed. I mean, that's where we get a lot of the details that aren't really backed up by primary sources. You know, the gun barrels were close enough to touch at the height of the fighting. There were 20 men for every man from Maine. That's where the story of Holman Melcher leading the charge opposed to Chamberlain comes from as well. It comes from Garish. So it's a book that I myself made use of when I was discussing Fredericksburg and the marches to and from various campaigns in the lead up to Gettysburg. But it's a book that really should not be relied upon as much as it is when it comes to Gettysburg. Yes, sir. And I believe, it, it, if I'm mistaken, I'm going to apologize up front, but the last time I was perusing through your book, I believe you've even identified areas where the official record itself may not have fully correct information in it. Would, you know, the, the, yes. the ultimate primary source has its own challenges. <laughs> Yes, uh, that, that's another thing I picked up from Thomas Desjardins. Uh, Chamberlain's official report of the fighting on the round top, it's about 2,500 words or so, dated July 6th. And like generations of historians, I didn't think anything of it when I first read it when he called it the round top, just, oh yeah, that's the name of the book. And then Desjardins starts breaking it down and if you get into Chamberlain's correspondence that stated the same day, July 6th, he calls it Wolf Hill or Sugarloaf Hill. The only time he calls anything Round Top is ref to refer to the larger hill, Big Round Top, today we call it. And you get into it and you find out the hill did not have a name. It was just an unnamed hill until 1867, which is the first time it's referred to as Little Round Top. So that really sort of starts setting off alarm bells about Chamberlain's account in the official record. Men, you're just thinking, well, they're an army on March, and they have been for a day and a half, two days now, by this point on July 6th, when he's submitting the report. And it's impressive that he can write 2,500 words with, I hate to say it so much, purple prose in an army on the march. And so that's weird. So you start really digging into it. You find in the 1880s when they're putting the official record together, they had misplaced the original report from the 20th Maine of the fighting on the Little Round Top. 
and they had to send Chamberlain a note basically asking him to pinky promise that they would that he would send them a copy of his report as he initially wrote it you know 20 years before at that point and Chamberlain sends back his six or seven page document 2500 words they just go okay here it is and stick it in the official records whereas if you go into the state archives of Maine and Augusta into the files of the state adjutant general a guy who was named John Hodgson at that time you find a completely different report. It's about a thousand pages short, about a thousand words shorter. It's not quite so elegiac. Uh, Chamberlain makes specific mention of the report that was published in the OR to officers who, if you go back and you look at the hospital records, hadn't died by the day he supposedly wrote the record, wrote the report. And those aren't mentioned at all in the copy that's up in Maine. And at best, it's an effort to rewrite the story with 20 years of hindsight to protect the reputation he built up in that time as the speaker, as the governor of Maine, as the president of Bowdoin College. And at worst, it's just a forgery that's been in the historical record, the official records of the, Civil, the War of the Rebellion, as the series is called, for 140 years at this point. Yes, sir. And so the, and that's kind of where you got to leave it yeah, from the standpoint of yeah. a, a best case or worst case scenario. It, 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 I think the, the, the major lesson to take away is the, the popular history isn't always the real history. And yes. somebody always has an agenda, how, however noble that agenda might be. So I, it, it, it's a it's a I, and that's what I really took away from your book. Uh, beyond what a remarkable officer Strong Vincent was, who certainly deserves his own volume and to be brought front and center back to the story of Little Round Top, not to displace Chamberlain, but to stand next to him as an officer yes. of equal stature. And it's, it's just an amazing work. So Hans, I really, really have enjoyed the book. I've enjoyed our conversation. You're a fantastically okay. knowledgeable historian. Uh, what's next for you? Uh, what's next for me uh, in August? I'm beginning my doctoral studies at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I've begun work on a second book, but I'm sort of playing it close to the best with what that is. I will say it's uh, same time period, similar subject. Uh, Fair enough. Hopefully get some minor interest flaring there. I'm hopeful my fine friends at Case Mate will have an interest in publishing that one as well when I finally finish it up. I'm about 70 pages into the manuscript at this point, so. That, that's outstanding. Well, it, w once Casemate picks it up and it's back and you're rolling that one out, I would really like to have you back on the show to discuss it. Well, I would definitely love to be back. Fantastic. So everybody, this has been uh, soon to be Dr. Hans Meyer. Not yet, but he will be. Uh, the book is The Lion of Round Top. It's about Strong Vincent and the, uh, the defense of Little Round Top during the battles of Gettysburg. It's I urge everybody to read it. It's just going to bring a fresh perspective on events we all think we know about. And it, it's uh, published by Case Made Publishing, a publishing house that I cannot uh, recommend enough. So Hans, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you very much for having me, Ben. Thank you, sir. You have a good night. You as well.